difference between having uh, a social hall where we just uh, are social networking to the to the idea of a fellowship hall where the word says in Acts 2.42 that the, that the new church uh, followed the disciples in their teaching in fellowship and in prayer. And Lord, we thank you that we can have Christian fellowship as believers and we pray that our fellowship might grow and that other people might might see us and say we we want what they've got we we want to do what they do and lord we we gather in your name and we have fellowship in your name and it's it's you who draws us together and you're the you're the common accord that uh, and the reason that we're all here together so lord hear these requests and you've heard this uh, prayer request for this five-year-old in south florida and, and for kim tomorrow and for lou as he recovers lord we just pray. We're, we're grateful that you're a God that knows our very frame. You know the hairs of our head are numbered. And um, you know us in ways better than we even know ourselves. And so, Father, hear the, the requests of our heart. Hear the prayers that we make. And we thank you for everyone that's here tonight. And we pray that as we pray these prayers that we might indeed understand that you are a God who can hear and who does answer prayer. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I had a couple of people tell me, and I'm, I'm going to turn it on. Um, Willie, are you, do, do you have the sound on the thing? Oh, good, the hearing affair does work, so if anybody wants to get the hearing assist out of the ushers, Miss Gaines is coming in, I know she's got hers with her, so um, it, it's working, and it works well. And I had a couple of people tell me that to catch up on the Bible study that they watched it online, so that's great. And you can pick up these. Um, you can pick up these Bible studies, and I really, really appreciate what Jim Weldy's doing. Uh, I don't know what kind of a rabbit you pulled out of the hat, but he texted me at something and said we didn't have any tapes. So apparently, did you find the tape? Good. You're a good man. Okay. Uh, now, just some housekeeping details. I'm gonna ask Nancy <laughs> as the group secretary. They help out with this. <laughs> no, you don't have to write anything. Um, now, we talked last week, in fact, Bill was the one that kind of prompted the idea of having the documents available online. Now, what we've done is, and I appreciate Ellen doing this. Ellen, uh, I guess, did you scan them? Is that what you did? She scanned them all and put them in a document and sent them to me as attachments. Now, and somebody said, now, wouldn't it be cheaper to pay $5 and get the documents here rather than have to run off your own printer on your own ink? And it's up to you. You can do what you want. But if you would like to get them online, if you would like to get them as attachments, if you'll put your email address down, because I do have the first three sets, the ones that we're going to hand out tonight, and I do have them available as scan documents, and if you'll put your email down, uh, I may be calling on some additional uh, secretarial help at some, at some point. Uh, if anybody would like to volunteer to help out with that, and I appreciate what Ellen's done is scanning these things, but we'll need to draw up an email list and then send it to anybody that wants it. So this is going to circulate. It's a bright blue with a purple pen, so purple ink. So don't lose my purple ink pen and my blue clipboard, and we'll circulate that. And if you'd like to get the uh, get the attachments, then we'll we'll send them out now. What we've got tonight is, now I want to set the stage for this, and I need for everybody to understand. You know, when you, when you teach, and those of you who have been teachers and, and are professional teachers, you know the thing that they tell you in public education as well, as in uh, classes on speeches and things like that, that it doesn't matter how large or small the group is, that anything you say is going to be missed totally by 10% of people listening to it. They're going to be 10% who aren't going to get anything, and then they're diminishing return or growing returns after that for the number of people that comprehend. Da da da. They're visual learners, non-visual learners, and you all we all fit into those categories. But here's what I want you to understand about um, about the study on Revelation, and, and it will help because it sets our it's kind of setting our paradigm for what we're doing. And that is that we looked at, at chapter 1 and why we need chapter 1 and why we need the vision okay. of a conquering um, king, why we need the vision we'll of the Lord as Saturday. he appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos. Um, and what was John doing there? He was in exile. He later died a martyr's death. But, um, but he was there and, and in the spirit on the Lord's day as we looked at last week. He saw a vision of Jesus. He didn't even know who it was that spoke to him. Now you can't say that about John up until the time of the ascension. You see, from the time that he first met Jesus and the three years of earthly ministry, 
they were very intimate. They were very close. They lived together. They, they slept in the same places. They ate the same food. They saw the same miracles. They heard the same teaching. He knew his voice. John knew Jesus' voice. He knew it as well as he knew his own. But he needed to see, like the church today needs to see Jesus as John saw him on the Isle of Patmos. Now, if anything, if anything, he was probably even closer because of the Holy Spirit of God. He was closer to his Christ after his ascension even than he was on earth because Jesus said, I will be in you. I will be in you. And the same one who was a part of the Trinity, the Holy Father, the Holy Son, the Holy Spirit, and the witness of the Spirit is that we're children of God. And if anything, John was closer to Jesus. It's hard to understand, but I believe that that's true. Jesus said to them, I will be in you. And yet he had to turn to see whose voice it was that spoke with him. The voice of a loud thunder. And it was Jesus. It was Jesus as we need to understand him when he comes back again. He's going to come back as a conquering king. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, uh, the potentate of all the earth and everything that he made. So John needed that. We need that. We need to understand that. Now, because that happened, and, and then we, we have in Revelation 2 and 3, we have Jesus then speaking. And if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll notice that in your Bible that the next chapters from the continuation of chapter 1 into chapters 2 and 3 are red letters. These are the words of Christ himself. He is speaking to the church and he wants these messages to go out to the church. And we looked last week at the fact that our founder, John Wesley, and I love this point of view because to me it's one of the three ways that you look at interpreting the scripture. Uh, John Wesley understood that the message to those churches were not just the message to the messages to the three churches in Turkey at the time, the seven New Testament churches, but they were to the church of all time. They were to the church that started on the day of, uh, uh, on the, I say on the day of Pentecost, the moving of the Holy Spirit, but you remember that I believe that the birth of the church was when Jesus breathed on the eleven and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, uh, the week after his crucifixion. So, it, the message was not just to those churches. They don't even exist today. In fact, I, I hear that there's one place that there may be a church that meets there, one of the Orthodox churches that still meets in the town of, well, I'm not going to say because I forget exactly which one it is. It would be a guess. I'd be right. Uh, I'd have one in seven chances of being right. So, uh, but anyway... They don't exist today. So therefore, there has to be some import to that message, such, some, uh, some important message that's so much more than just to those seven churches. So that's what we're going to look at on Sunday morning, Revelation 2 and 3. In other words, that's a separate segment. It's kind of a sectional study of the book of Revelation. What we're going to do tonight is pick up chapter 4. Okay? We're going to pick up with chapter 4 because there's a very distinct division between the red letter words that stop in your New Testament until chapter 4 begins. Now, there's a reason for that, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. And again, Nancy's got this wonderful slide up, and we've got a new projector coming, y'all. For some reason, we just can't figure out why this thing goes out on us like it does. But you see the, you see the churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And this is the order in which Christ speaks to uh, these churches. Um, in Revelation 2 and 3. So 2 and 3, next seven Sundays, will be what we'll look at on Sunday morning. Chapter 4 tonight. So if you've got your Bible and want to turn to chapter 4, what I want to do is pass out, if you'll just take one of these, and it's three-ring three -ring notebook paper. Nancy, we take the top one now. I think she kept the see if James will come down here. This is, um, this is just an outline. It's not anything profound. Um, this is an, an outline of chapter 4 for you to take notes on because... Uh, there are several several things that we'll look at in chapter 4 that I think are very, very significant for us. Now, these are the notes uh, for tonight. <laughs> now, here, here's what I need for you to do. This is, this is still part of the housekeeping. Um, the definition of the Antichrist. Now, those of you who paid the $5 for, and that's for all of the notes now, okay? That'll, that'll be the entire glossary of terms that I'm giving you. 
And there were some of you who paid, I think about 10 or 15 that paid that didn't get the first 10 that were printed off. So if you are one of those who paid the $5 or would like to pay the $5 and get all of the notes in print, and like I say, for and I repeat this for those of you who may not have been here last week, that the five dollars is just to pay the church for the paper, okay? And that's just to go toward expenses. So um, this this is the ten or fifteen of you that didn't that did not get a copy last week and paid the five dollars. So that's reserved for you. Now, if these run out and you would like to get a copy, give me your name and put we'll get you on the list because Melinda now has uh, a list and she's running the rest of these off based on those of you who said that you wanted to get this, okay? We're trying to save the church money. We don't want to just print them off and, and not have you take them or use them. So this is tonight's um, this is tonight's notes, and let me just uh, tell you briefly what they are so that you will uh, know what you're getting. It's, it's the notes, the definition of Armageddon, and the dam uh, definition of Babylon, and I think, yeah, I think that ends it. So this is, uh, this is Armageddon. The two terms that are defined in here are Armageddon and Babylon. Babylon the Great. So if you want a copy of this. Now this stack has enough for all of you who paid last week and got last week's notes and, uh, and we're planning on getting tonight's notes. So that's here for you, okay? And if you want to pay the $5 and get added to that list, you can. Now, to, to start us off tonight, I need you to understand very something very, very significant. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. And uh, Nancy, if you'd hold up Revelation 4 first. Now, if you've got a Bible that titles your, your uh, paragraphs, you'll see a, a title here maybe. Mine does. It says, The Throne Room of Heaven. Now we have to be very cautious. I, you know, there, there's one thing that I think is very critical about the Word of God. Always, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a small group leader, whether you preach the Word of God, the Word of God is something that we that we handle with with hands of clay. We we it, it is the eternal Word of God. I believe in the importance of it, as Hebrews says about itself, that it's living, active, vital, uh, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, just like the bones and the marrow are separated out. So it is that the Word of God is a discerning Word. It is a living Word. It, it does things that no other Word, whether it's some great tome like One Piece or, or the trilogy of the, the Lord of the Rings that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, the Bible is distinct. It is unique. It is living. It is active. It is the Word of God. It is the way of salvation. It is the plan of salvation. It is God's plan for your life. Your life is in it. Your direction is in it. The things that you need to know for this life and the next are in it. Therefore, uh, in my in my mind, it's something that I take as a sacred as a sacred trust. I. I am uh, at ordination empowered by the bishop to proclaim the word of the living God. And I have always taken that very, very seriously because my father was a minister and my father-in-law was, was uh, a minister. And I understand that just like poor therapy, there's nothing worse than poor exegesis on the word. And what we mean by that is when the word is read and, and you try to explain it. Now, we're not always necessarily going to agree, but it says, it's as John Wesley said, in the fundamentals, we need to agree on the fundamentals, the cross, who Christ was, why he came into the world, and why he died on the cross, why he rose from the dead. Those are, those are fundamentals of the Word of God. But now the interpretation of, of other scriptures, it, it, it can be very difficult. And we're not, we don't all necessarily uh, agree on interpretation. So therefore we handle especially something when it comes to prophecy very tenderly, very tenderly. Um, there are a few things in the book of Revelation that I will be very dogmatic about, but most of the things when it comes to interpreting prophecy I will not be dogmatic about. I will tell you what I believe and why I believe it. But we have to be very, very careful in handling the Word of God. Now, fourth chapter opens up well 
first of all, let me say this. When we're, when we're handling the Word of God, understand the difficulty that the prophet had. And I'm going to call him the prophet because he was an apostle. But at this point in time, he is, he is prophesying because the Holy Spirit of God is revealing to him things that were going to come in the future. How would the prophet describe... If, he, if John were to be transported in time... You know, I shared with the kids one night at NYF that that um, the theory of relativity, really, if you if you reduce it down very simply, Einstein believed that time was a river. It was a flowing river. And if if this is this this aisle down the middle here, if this is a flowing river, Einstein believed that as long as you were in that river, you were moving forward. But he believed that through mathematics, you could understand that you could step out of the river. And you could go this way and go back in time and step into the river. Now, that's a simplified definition of the theory of relativity. But that's what it ultimately means. Or you could even go forward in time. Now, magnetism gets into that. Einstein once said that the nation that controls magnetism will control the universe. And there's some incredible secrets behind that. We don't have time to go into tonight. But it's an incredible, it's an incredible, incredible thing. So, how would John describe the things in your house if you were to walk into it tonight? Say he could be transported in time and come from 2,000 years ago into the future and go home with you tonight and walk into your house. How would you describe to the Apostle John, how, how would you describe your cell phone? How would you describe a television? How would you describe an automobile? You know, what, what kind of language? Now, for that reason then, put yourself back 2,000 years ago and say that in some of this, and this is a part of interpretation, and I'll, and I'll share with you where this gets to be very difficult, but if John is looking into the future, and just like TV programs, science fiction programs that, that project the future and talk about the future and have futuristic ideas and things and, and events, and it almost seems if we can conceive of it that eventually it can happen. But how would John, in an age of donkeys and camels and no san indoor sanitation and no running water, how would he describe if he did see a war? How would he describe the engines of war? What kind of language would he use? So you see, part of the difficulty that we've got in interpretation is, now, and please understand when I say this, that it's a difficulty, but it's not a sprue block. Okay? It, it might be difficult, and it might be something that we have to think about and work through. But oh my, what better thing to think about? What better thing to, to work through than to try to seek to understand some of these things? So there's a divine mystery about this, part of which we won't understand until we get to heaven. But please understand when I say that that doesn't mean that we don't try. That does not mean that we don't work at it. That's why we're meeting here on Wednesday night, to go through Revelation and to see what we can get from it. Now, that having been said, we are going to see here the very first thing, something that even using the word door, or the idea of heaven, or the description of things we're going to see in a moment, John's describing something that is in heaven. What kind of language is he going to use? What does God want us to understand from this? Now, I think there's some wonderful things. And let's start with the first verse in chapter 4. After these things. Now, this is an important phrase, transitional phrase. Please understand that. Because let me tell you what I put into this phrase of after these things. The church. This is an important part of interpreting the book of Revelation. Remember that in chapter 1, we've got the author. It's Christ himself, King of kings, Lord of lords. 
chapters 2 and 3, messages to the churches. The church is not spoken of again now. From now until the 19th chapter of Revelation. Key that in as critical and crucial to your interpretation of Revelation. You may like that. You may agree with it, especially when you get the definitions that I'm handing you that have to do with the church and, and several other things that are critical issues. And you may not like it. And, and when you come up with something that you disagree or something that you've heard, ask me about it or come by and let's talk about it because I enjoy talking about these things. In fact, I have to keep from getting overly excited. The older I've got, the more I've learned not to let my voice get high and race in my speaking because I get, I get overly excited about these things. But into this phrase, after these things, this is where I place the rapture. Now, not just because of those words, but this is where it fits, okay? After these things, and I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first verb, voice, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he, he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow about the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now, we'll stop there for just a minute. God had always said that no one would see God's face and live. Now, John is not either not permitted or he can't quite discern what does the personage of the Heavenly Father look like sitting on the throne? That's not for us to know. And we have to content ourselves with John describing the one who sat on the throne in something that is beautiful, something that is precious. Even the rainbow itself in describing the rainbow, a, a sign of a covenant, a promise that God made. And the one who sits on the throne is the one who makes promises and who keeps promises. And what John is seeing and what John is being given here is for us to understand that this God is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. And we, we don't get any more definition than what these beautiful stones are. He sees one like a sorry. So what does that mean? I, I don't know except that I know that there's beauty, there's majesty, and there's mystery. And I'm content to live that mystery. Because one day we will stand before this throne. And there won't be any questions. But right now we've got those questions, okay? A throne around the throne in appearance like an emerald, describing the rainbow. Now, I need you to understand this before we go on. I have over here a picture of the tabernacle cutaway. Nancy, put up there uh, Hebrews 8, the Hebrews verse 8, 5, and, uh, and then the 9, follow with the 9, 24. In the book of Hebrews, what we find is, and, and we'll have a good time when we study Hebrews. I, I get almost as excited about doing Hebrews as I do about doing Revelation because Hebrews helped the Jewish Christians to understand the significance of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, and how Christ was the fulfillment of the law of the Old Testament. Now, I want you to understand that when God gave the children of Israel these things, this was the tabernacle before Solomon built the temple. And in Hebrews 8, 5, we read these words. He says, who serve, he's talking about earthly priests, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And then go ahead and do 924 too. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, listen, which are copies of the true. This is a copy of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now he's talking about the mediatorial work of Christ as our high priest. This, when God gave Moses the instructions about how to make this tabernacle, he said, do it exactly as I'm telling you, because this is a pattern 
of what exists in heaven. Now, friends, we'll understand, we're going to understand when we do this Bible study, and especially when we come to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, which to me is one of the most exciting chapters in the Word. You don't think that until you understand what's being said. But in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, we understand that this is the temple, a cutaway of Solomon's temple. This is a picture of what the temple might have uh, looked like uh, when it was built from the outside. And you see the court of the Jews and the Gentiles and then the inner court. And then you see the cutaway, the Holy of Holies. Listen, friends, I want to tell you, Scott Morrison and I were talking about this last week at the end of Bible study. This is the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. This is the veil. The veil in front of the Holy of Holies. Now, at the moment, now I hear this because this is this is incredible. We don't we don't get all of this unless we study it. At the moment that Christ died on the cross in the third hour, the very moment, the high priest stood before here before the Holy of Holies. This veil was thirty six feet high. It weighed six tons. When we think of veil, we think of a bridal veil. You know, a big thin gossamer thing that you can see through that hangs over a bride's face until that moment of revelation at the altar. This was a heavily sewn, gold embroidered uh, curtain, purple, gold woven into it. It weighed six tons. They had to run ropes outside the temple to oxen that drew it into place when Solomon first built it. And then do you remember what Matthew tells us at the moment that Christ died on the cross? That the veil, that's right, Lou, that the veil in front of the Holy of Holies was torn into, the word says, from top to bottom. Can you imagine the shock of the high priest who's standing in front of that thing with a censer in his right hand with a golden bowl with the blood of the sacrifice of the atoning lamb, the perfect little lamb. He's ready to go behind this and God said nobody but the high priest one day a year can go behind this curtain to offer this sacrifice. Nadab and Abihu were two sons of Aaron who tried to go behind this curtain when it was first the tabernacle. They tried to go into the Holy of Holies back here, behind the veil. And you know what happened? It wasn't their job. They weren't supposed to. And fire came out from the Lord and destroyed them. Aaron was shocked. Now, on this, on this particular chart, too, we have a picture of the makeup of the dress of the high priest as he went in. If you'll notice around the bottom hem here, not the very bottom, but the, the hem right above the, the bottom hem, there are bells sewn into this garment. Do you know why those bells were there? And he wore around his waist a sash. Because when he went in, if he was not holy before God, if he wasn't dressed right, if he hadn't prepared himself correctly, he was going to die. He would die behind the veil. And nobody could go back there and get him. And they would have to pull his body out. Now can you imagine the shock of the high priest who stood in front of that veil on the day of atonement when Christ died on the cross and it was torn. I've often described it this way. I can see two angels. See, angels are the ones who do these things. I can see two angels and they've got a hold of this curtain at the top. And they're holding on just as hard as they can and they're waiting for that word that comes from the throne, this throne that John sees. And they're waiting for that word. And when Jesus gave out a loud cry and said, it is finished, and died on that cross, God said it's done. It's completed. The demand has been satisfied. And he gave those two angels the go ahead. And they tore that curtain from top to bottom. And what had never been seen by human beings out here was now open to the eyes of the world. 
And the writer of the Hebrews explains this to us. And he says that through the veil that is to say his flesh, Christ has opened to us heaven. Listen, whereas in the Old Testament, the Israelites had to have a priest, your high priest is Christ. And you can fall on your face before God. You can get on your knees beside your bed. You can kneel at the altar of Brunswick First Methodist Church. You can make any place an altar. Because the way to the throne of heaven itself is available to you because of Jesus. It's incredible to understand. Just incredible. We don't, we don't understand the timing and the importance of everything that happened. Paul had a glimpse of it when he said in Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Oh, listen, God's had this thing planned out. We, 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 we're participants in it. See, we, we think we choose so much. And we have free will. We do. But oh, you see, God's got the big plan. And it's all worked out. Now here's the throne room of heaven. Immediate line was, uh, I saw one on the throne. Move down to the verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now we'll look at that in just a minute. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, now here's the first song of heaven, Dr. Clem Coleman, who was my evangelism professor at Asbury Seminary, wrote a, song, wrote a book, wrote several books, Master Plan of Evangelism and so on, a lot, of, a lot of books on how to witness and lead somebody to the Lord. But Robert Coleman wrote a book called The Songs of Heaven. And oh, how it just, oh, it'll, it'll bless your heart if you, if you ever run up on a copy of it. Songs of Heaven. Here's one of the Songs of Heaven, the Trisagion. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Have you heard the group casting crowns? This is where they get the name. Cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now, remember that the things in heaven are set forth in earthly language. This chapter 4 is the beginning of a new phase of the vision that God has given to John the Baptist. It's a new phase. It's the things that are going to happen. We're taken first to the throne room of heaven because this is where the plan is going to be initiated for all of the things that are going to happen on the earth that we're going to read about starting in chapter 6. They come about because of what happens in the throne room of heaven. Now, it sounds so diminutive to say throne room of heaven. I, I almost hesitate even to use those words. We, we, can't, we can't imagine the majesty. We, we can't comprehend the glory of heaven. We try. But see, I'd like to, I'd like to see inside each of your heads and to see the picture that you paint for yourself of this scene. And it can't begin to compare with what heaven really is. But we try. We try. Now, it's the Father's home. This is the Father's home. Do you remember that Jesus said in the 14th chapter of John, In my Father's house are many mansions. Listen, I don't like the word room translated there. There might be a lot of rooms, but I'll tell you what, uh, heaven is a grandiose place. It's a grandiose place. And in my Father's house are many mansions. This is a throne, majesty, mystery. Listen, Isaiah saw it. Ezekiel saw it. They saw it. 
They were two other human beings who were privileged to see the throne of heaven being led by the Holy Spirit of God in heaven. That much of heaven opened to them. And oh my, what did they do in the presence of the throne? It made them look inside. I mean, Isaiah the prophet said, you know, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet. I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angel took coals up from off the altar and anointed him and told him to go and preach to his people. Okay. Um, 24. The number 24. Now, seven. First of all, the seven spirits of God, to me, uh, are interpreted to be the church of the ages. There are seven churches, seven church ages, uh, seven periods of church history, and seven spirits of God, and that is the that is the church. Now, the four living creatures. What can we say about the four living creatures? Well, I think we need to understand the significance of the numbers as much as anything. And any time that you run up on four, to me these are these are typical. Now, you see, we're going to we're going to kind of float back and forth, and we're going to do it with some bit of disc discretion based on our study. Okay, uh, it's not necessarily a good system, and it doesn't always work. Frankly. It creates some frustration. But there's going to be metaphor, there's going to be symbols, there are going to be types, and there's just going to be the thing as it is. Okay? So we need to wade through it. We really do. And it's worth it. It's worth it. The four living creatures to me are the Gospels. The Gospels. How significant are is the Word of God that is contained in the four Gospels that give us the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, where it comes from, how it got started, how the church came into being. Now, the 24 elders, I think, are types of, if not themselves, the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, and then the 12 apostles. Okay? I don't, I don't think that was too hard. In fact, most of the people, people have asked me, say, who do you, who do you study when you study Revelation? Well, Clarence Larkin is a man that, that I like. He uh, was a man toward the early part of the last century who did a lot of work on prophecy. Uh, I use the pulpit commentary. I use Matthew Henry's commentary, by the way. If you've got a droid, you can download Matthew Henry's commentary for free. Now, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot in there. But uh, Matthew Henry was a real student of the Word of God. And, uh, and other people that, that I'll refer to in, in some of the notes there. But I really believe that the 24 thrones that he sees in the throne room are typical of, of the uh, patriarch. And maybe even, may even be the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and then the twelve apostles. But notice the song. Notice the song. You know, don't we from, and I close with this, don't we from time to time engage in worship wars in the church? You know, contemporary worship versus traditional worship versus Hispanic worship or whatever. And we get into wars about worship. Y'all, stop and think for a minute. What is worship? Oh, my. Worship ought to take us before the presence of God. Now, you can say, well, you know, contemporary music doesn't take me to the presence of God. And it may not. You may say the old hymns don't take me before the presence of God. I would suggest to you that one of the things that you need to contemplate is the heart of the author and the composer who wrote the things that they write. And there's a distinctive difference. We may not like the beat, we may not like the volume, we may not like the sound, but there is something distinctive when a person is writing from their heart about their experience of God and their willingness to be in His presence. You know, the song I can only imagine, Stole Hearts, as soon as it came out, I can only imagine what I'll do when I see Him face to face. But one thing I'll do is that I'll worship Him. For He alone is worthy of glory, honor, power, Riches and might. For he made all things. And without him, 
Someone says, was not anything made that was made. We learn true worship when we get our eyes off of ourselves and off of what we want and onto the one who gave himself for us. Lord, as we go from this place tonight, again, we thank you for your word. It is living. It is active. It is vital. You want to teach us through it. You want to lead us in it. You want us to discover more about you because we're in it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You're dismissed. Come on, get these sheets for those of you who paid for them, and if you'd like to add your name to this, feel free.